it's very, very, very encouraging to see people here after the last two weeks of messages. <laughs> Uneasy laughter, makes sense. Um, been a bit dicey last couple weeks as we're going through First Kings. We're getting a heavy dose of, uh, of something. And uh, I really am thankful um, that people are coming to hear God's word. Um, I'm thankful for the people who are encouraging me because you know that I'm, I'm just kind of trying to do my best and uh, I'm not perfect in any way and don't have all this stuff figured out, but I'm trying to really d dissect what our culture, um, cultural moment is, is describing to us as a vision for God's righteousness and, and then trying to get in the biblical narrative and find what is really a vision for God's righteousness um, over against what is, is popular in our culture, maybe even um, what is against what's going on in our own souls and minds. And, uh, and I don't claim to be good at it or perfect at it in any way, um, but I'm, I'm doing my best and thankfully we have the Word of God. Um, I have some people that I, I'm able to process with. Um, I really do feel like the messages that, that I've been preaching really do represent our elder team here and our, our, our um, leadership teams here, our staff, all of those things. So I feel good about all of that, but I also know that um, words can go different ways and they can come out, um, they can hit people in different ways. And so I'm also thankful for all the people who have been engaging um, in some dialogue with me through email saying, I heard you say this, I just wanna unpack that a little bit, make sure I'm hearing what you're saying. Um, because I know there are people who are deciding whether they want to really stick with living streams or not. I mean, because um, we're, we're, we're really kind of drawing some lines that, uh, that, are, that are not super popular um, in society today. And uh, so some people are deciding to, to move on. And I don't, I don't blame them, you know, if that's, that's what they feel, um, because we're, we're not going to adjust or budge um, or try and let the culture dictate uh, what, what we preach or what the Word of God says. We're gonna let the Word of God, you know, interpret our culture for us, and, uh, and it's interesting. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. I, I do feel a lot of encouragement, and, I, and a really, a lot of people, the most encouragement I feel is when someone is willing to actually dialogue and say, I heard you say this. So if you're thinking about leaving or thinking about saying, I can't be here anymore, I totally understand, but I would like to just be able to have a conversation before you go. Um, just to make sure we are dividing over what we're actually dividing over and not just um, heard something strange or weird that I was saying, because I know I can mess up too. So with that being said, thanks for being here. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week <laughs> because we're still in First Kings. Um, Easter's coming, by the way. And uh, yeah, but First Kings is, is here. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be going through 1 Kings again. We've been looking at this super, super, super ancient Near Eastern um, document that's been preserved for all this time. And uh, it's very old. It's very outdated. It's very um, different culture, all of these things. And yet, um, we think it's the inspired Word of God and has a lot to say to us um, because people really aren't that different from the, the way they've always been. We have the same problems and challenges, but we've seen lots of connections from First Kings. There's uneasy transfers of power, which is uh, something that we've experienced in America. There's debates and divisions over taxes. Again, America, there's lots of divisions over political issues. They're building a wall, <laughs> which is fun. Um, and it's a time in Israel's history where there is tons of prosperity. Prominence, prosperity, world power, all of that is going on. And that's what we're experiencing in. And at the same time as this is going on, the writer, um, who most likely is Jeremiah, is recording for us um, a lot of the idolatry that was taking place in the midst of the prosperity. And so um, I think we're experiencing right now in America that all of our prosperity has led us to um, some forms of idolatry in our nation uh, that displeased God. And so this, this prophet was writing to his people in his day to try and warn them to not fall into these traps. And, uh, and I'm using this book and we're trying to warn ourselves from the same traps so we don't fall into um, some of those things. There's a continuous redefining of who God is 
and what worship is to be. Um, we've described that in our context, like we have a cross up here. Um, and in their day, they had the worship of Yahweh, um, the God that brought them out of Egypt and made them into a nation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on and on. And so they would worship Yahweh, but over time they decided that they didn't just wanna worship Yahweh, but all the other nations around them had other gods as well, so they decided maybe if we worship Yahweh and the other gods, we'll get like double, triple up, you know? We'll get triple the blessing. We'll get it all, and so they begin to bring in things like Baal worship. They begin to bring things in like Asherah pole. They never took down the cross, so to speak. They just started adding other things to their worship. But what they didn't realize is that God of the Bible, Yahweh, is a very jealous God. And not in the petty junior high type jealousy, but in the idea of a, of a, of a woman who's married to a man, and all of a sudden he decides he wants to bring in other women to the relationship. The jealousy that she would feel for her husband would be righteous and right, saying this is not right. And God himself is the, is the source of that righteous jealousy. And God says, no, I'm not gonna stand here and let you add, add other gods to the worship of me. You get me or you get nothing. And that's ultimately what happened in Israel's history. And Jeremiah, as he was prophesying, he was called the weeping prophet because he kept prophesying, people kept going, Eh, you're annoying. He kept prophesying, they'd be like, hey, throw him in prison. He kept prophesying, they'd be like, hey, put him in a pit. That way we can't hear him anymore. And he just leave him in a pit for a while. He's the weeping prophet because he was prophesying as he watched this unfold before his eyes as people continued to practice idolatry and ultimately the nation of Israel was completely destroyed in just a few hundred years. America, where are you? America, are you willing to listen? We're coming up on a few hundred years, and where are we gonna be? Where are we gonna be? And I don't know how to change America. I can pray for them, we can reach out, we can do all those things, but one of the things is we really wanna make sure that none of this shows up inside our church, inside our fellowship and our family. So we're gonna preach about it. Um, Tim Keller wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods as he is trying to help the church in America understand culturally what the idolatry of today is. Um, some of the things that he said is an idol, an idol is something we cannot live without, we must have it, therefore it drives us to break rules we once honored to harm others, even ourselves, in order to get it. So it's basically these things that we used to hold as true and right, we now want these other things and these things standing in our way, so we begin to just kind of put those to the side. Maybe something like this right here um, is happening today. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Sorry if that freaked you out super bad. I was just trying to like make a point, but it came out a little bit abrupt. Um, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God give, can give. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living at all. The first thing that came to my mind was the song Driver's License. <laughs> Sorry. If you don't know what that is, good, it's good, you're good, you're good. Um, yeah. Um, next, if I have that, then I will feel like my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value and I'll feel significant and secure. The that which he is referring to are the idols in our lives. Some people that I've been asking recently, what do you see as the idols of our day? Comfort, convenience, safety, and security. Tyler Johnson, who's a pastor here in Phoenix, he says those are the idols of our day. Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, talks about money, sex, and power being the idols of our day. Dan Riccio says self, uh-oh, <laughs> that one gets to the point. Self is an idol in our day. Sex, money, power, acclaim, security are the idols of our day. We want those things even more than we want God. Or we're willing to compromise even what God has asked of us in order to get those things. And then one of the things that I feel like has been really important for me to bring out, um, and this is just me, I only came up with one. Those other guys had a bunch of other ones, but... Um, our desires. I think that's the idolatry of America today. And I think that's the idolatry that's seeping into our churches. That somehow we're allowing our desires to dictate what is right and wrong. 
And you hear it in society, you do you. You know, whatever you want, that's what you should be. That's who you should be. But our desires do not belong on the throne of our lives. That's one of the reasons why we keep this cross up here. Yes, to remind us of what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice that he paid so that we never have to fear God ever again. We never have to fear death ever again. But also as a reminder to us that 99, I've been saying 90, I'm going up to 99 now, 99% of following Jesus is denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. And denying ourselves means we do not give in to our disordered desires. We are constantly battling between what is a desire within us that is of God and what is a desire within us that is not of God. And we deny the ones that are disordered. And we live into the ones that are not. This is very hard stuff. It's very hard stuff. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying, oh, just go do it. <laughs> it's very hard stuff. And that's why he was a weeping prophet. And so then 1 Kings chapter 11, let's jump in here. We are gonna take communion for those online. If you don't have um, that stuff ready, we're gonna have communion at the end of the service so you can prepare that um, for you and your household. But 1 Kings chapter 11, verse one. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, a little bit north of here, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love, idolatry, and he called it love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. This caused him to follow Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. Wow. We're in a different place here. Last week, we were reading 1 Kings chapter three where Solomon prays this beautiful prayer. God's asking him, Solomon, I'll give you anything. What do you want? And instead of asking for all of the idolatry type things, Solomon said, God, can you give me a heart that listens to you? I don't want to even have a heart that knows the truth, so to speak because then I might put myself on the throne and decide what is true and right. He said, could you just give me a heart that listens to you, that can hear you, because you're the only one that sees clearly, you're the only one that should be on the throne. Hallelujah, this is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. We should be praying it every day, because we live in a crazy world. And then we get to see the display of that where Solomon is able to bring absolute justice, beautiful, righteous, justice into a very troubling street level justice issue between two prostitutes and one baby. And it was just awesome. And everyone who got to see it was so refreshed that justice and truth can happen in our day. And it was just awesome. And then that's chapter three, chapter three through 10. You just get to see that Solomon's bringing out the wisdom. He's executing justice. He's ordering Israel in such a way that it is just causing the most flourishing and the most freedom for everybody there. The nations around them, instead of warring with them, they send delegations to come sit at the feet of Solomon just to listen to what he might have to say so that they could experience a little bit of the freedom and flourishing that came through the Judeo ethic. And Solomon builds the temple for the Lord. And Solomon builds a palace for himself, and Solomon built a wall around Jerusalem. 
And it starts to describe all of the grain that was brought to Solomon every day because of all of the fruitfulness of the fields. And then it describes all of the flour that was brought in for his table as they made all the food for all the people. And then he talks about all the gold that was brought in as tributes from other nations. And the wealth and the prominence and the prosperity was amazing. Actually, the, the title of the last chunk of scripture in chapter 10 is Solomon's Splendor. It's beautiful what the Lord had done and what Solomon was experiencing and the people of Israel were experiencing. And then the weeping prophet <laughs> who's recording for us a little bit of what happened. He says, however, Solomon loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. There was a disordered desire within Solomon that was not in line with the decrees and statutes and commands of God. And Solomon went for it. Maybe he thought, I'm doing everything else the Lord is asking me to do. What's the problem with this one little one? He wasn't willing to deal with the little foxes like we talked about two weeks ago. And I don't think that when Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter, that was the first one, I don't think he thought, all right, one down, 999 to go. I don't think that was the vision that he had. I don't think he thought, I'll marry Pharaoh's daughter and then I'll marry a whole bunch of others. It's just like those who get married, they don't come to the altar and, and profess their vows to each other thinking, maybe. You know, even though half of them, so to speak, end in divorce, I don't think half of them are going, yeah, we'll see how this goes. But little foxes come in, and then other little foxes, and other little foxes. And so Solomon basically made one decision of compromise sexually. And it led to another and another and another and another and another and another and another. Because sin is never satisfied. Sex is never satisfied. And many of us sitting in this room or listening online, we can think about the one time we made a compromise and how many more compromises it led to until ultimately you're in bondage. And Solomon, Solomon, the wisest person of all, he fell in this way. And he ended up with a thousand wives, well, 700 of royal birth wives and then 300 concubines, which are basically just illegitimate wives because he decided to go for one. And not only that, but then he decided to keep those wives happy. He started building high places of worship. He built the temple for Yahweh and then he started building temples for all the other gods. Just in case you don't quite understand historically what it means to build a high place of worship for another god, the gods of, that were described in here, basically what was happening is Solomon built the correct form of worship for Yahweh and a temple for that, and then he built these other temples, and these other temples, a lot of them had to do with fertility, these gods. It was a very agrarian society, and so if you wanted your, your lands to be fertile, if you wanted your family to be fertile, your, your wives to be fertile, then you would pray to these gods and they would cause your lands to be fertile, which was a really important deal when you're trying to grow stuff. And your, and your, and your wives to be fertile, which is really important if you want to survive, have people to work the fields maybe. <laughs> and so a lot of these gods had this kind of concept, if you worship me, then you will be prosperous, you'll be fertile. But what they required as worship was for you to give up your sexuality, to give up your virginity. 
practicing worship for these gods had oftentimes going and linking yourself with a temple prostitute of some sort or giving up your virginity to one of these priests or priestesses. And if you offer that sacrifice, then this God will bless you with fertility. And sex became rampant. And then sad to say, others of these gods were gods that actually required human sacrifice. One tradition talks about the god Moloch described here as this, this statue of iron that, that had a head of kind of like an ox of some sort. And he would have his arms out like this and, and then inside the belly was kind of this hollowed out thing and they would build a fire. And in that, that fire would then warm up the iron and warm up the hands till it was red hot and they would come and they would lay their babies on his hands and watch their babies burn up as a sacrifice so that they could be fertile. This is what Solomon produced in Israel. And Israel never recovered until it was destroyed. And if we don't think we have a sex problem in America, if we don't think we've created an idolatry, out of, an idol out of sex, and the compromise and the giving of ourselves in all these different sexual ways, we're so blind. And sad to say, what Solomon didn't probably even know until he saw it was the, the, the sexual kind of reality of all this idolatry ultimately led to the killing of babies. And if we don't think we have that problem in our society, we're blind as well. Our lust, our giving over to sexual desires that are disordered and outside the context of the scriptures has not led to a little, it's led to a lot of damage for our society. And sad to say, it's led to a lot of damage for a generation of unborn. And we get to see it in Solomon's day, and you get to hear the weeping prophet Jeremiah say, please wake up. And we get to read the scriptures, and there's so much detail about sex in the Bible. And whenever sex is done outside the context of one man and one woman, it does not lead to anything good. It leads to destruction, and most often it's not even the destruction of the person, it's the destruction of the people that come after them. The scariest thing about sin is you get to choose your sin, but you don't get to choose the consequence. And even scarier than that is you don't get to choose who gets the consequence. Because most often it's the ones who come after you. It's the ones who you love the most, that suffer the most. That's true in Solomon's day as well. So, now you see why I'm thankful that people keep showing up because I'm just saying things and, yeah. But this is, our, this is our reality. This is us. When you read Solomon, you're like, yeah, that's me, except for all the rich and smart stuff. And the way Paul describes it in the New Testament is he actually describes a war going on inside of us. He uses the word war when he describes the battle between our spirit and our flesh, basically our, our, our ordered desires and our disordered desires. It's a war. It's a challenge, it's a difficulty, it's something that, that causes pain and frustration and agony and sleepless nights and prayers and groanings within us. And if we're honest, we all know that war. We have a nature inside of us that was given to us from, from Adam that wants to go against the things of God. And those of us who have given our life to Christ, we now have the spirit inside of us who's, who's compelling us to go towards the things of Christ. But it's a war, it's a battle. Just the other day I was with a family and one of their daughters who's young, it was so funny because she wanted to say something 
that, that was gonna be like gossipy. She wanted to say something about what everybody was saying about this one person. And the mom was like, no. And she was like, well, let me just, and she was like, no. She was like, but what about, no. It was, it was just like, what is happening here? This, like, she could not keep it in. It was like she needed to say this juicy morsel of gossip so badly. And the mom was just cutting her down, cutting her off, cutting her off. And I was like, this is so interesting. And then it was funny because she finally stopped and the mom was like, as soon as we go inside later, she's going to still say it. Like she can't help. And it's just, it's, it's the way it is within us. It's alive in us. It was alive in Solomon. And that is truth. All that we've been saying these last few weeks, this is the truth. This is the truth we need to hear. God is setting before us a blessing and a curse. If you walk in this way, you will be free. You will flourish in the things of God. And you will be setting up your children in the generations to come for prosperity and goodness in the Lord. And if you do not, so this is true. We have to hear this. We have to know this. But thanks be to God that there's more to the story. To who our God is. He is full of truth and he's full of grace. And as I was reading, I stumbled across something that I want us all to hear. It's so important and I'm so excited about this. I didn't, I don't, not as excited about what I just preached. I'm excited about this, what I'm preaching right now. The Lord became angry with Solomon. Not that part. Because his heart had turned away from the Lord. Not that part. The God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, watch out, watch out, Father heart of God coming through. For the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So God visits Solomon again, finding him in all this idolatry, finding his heart going from having a discerning heart to a divided heart, leading his people into all of this disgusting, detestable idolatry, paving the way for pain and agony, for his children and the children of Israel. And God comes to him because he hates sin and what it does. And he says, Solomon, I'm gonna have to punish you and I'm gonna tear the kingdom away from you. Nevertheless, I'm not gonna do it in your lifetime for the sake of David. But I'm gonna tear it from your son, yet, I'm not gonna tear it all from him for the sake of David. You see in God, this, this, if, God, if God was just all about truth, Solomon would be over and to be honest, humanity would be over already as well. But the God of the Bible is very peculiar. The God of the Bible is very scandalous. Because there's this razor's edge to his character that's described in Exodus 34. He is for sure not going to leave the guilty unpunished. But he is also abounding in mercy and kindness and faithfulness. And he loves to forgive. And in this chapter, we get to see the nature of God. He's disgusted and heartbroken over the idolatry and what it's going to produce and what it's going to cause, not just for Solomon, but for his children. And that stuff does play out. There are consequences to sin every single time. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but then it's destruction. And sad to say, it's not just destruction for you. It's also for the ones you love. But at the same time, God always is full of grace and mercy. And here it is, in the Old Testament, we see a little bit of a picture of a New Testament principle. When God says, for the sake of David, Solomon, you're gonna escape punishment. For the sake of David, Solomon, the promise that I made, that David will always have someone sit on the throne, will remain intact. 
And sure enough, that promise did remain intact all the way until there was one born of the seed of David or the line of David, and his name was Jesus. And he's become a king that reigns forevermore. And what the New Testament picks up right there is, is kind of bouncing off this. For the sake of David, Solomon escaped punishment and received the promise. And for the sake of Jesus Christ, everyone who believes in him escapes punishment and receives the full promise of God. This is the way Paul says it in Romans chapter five. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, now Paul's talking about Adam, but you could also talk about Solomon, or you could put your own name in there. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The message translation says it this way. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all in trouble with sin, that's you and me and Adam and Solomon. Another person did it right and got us out of it, that's Jesus. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness that we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life, a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. For the sake of David, Solomon escaped punishment and the promise stayed intact. And for the sake of Jesus, you and I who have the same heart as Solomon, you and I who have stories of divorce, you and I who have the stories of of sexual immorality, you and I who have story after story of compromise of little foxes, you and I that can think of all the times we blew it, which led to all the times we blew it, You and I who have no right to escape the punishment for our sins, and you and I who have no right to the full promise of God, which is that we are co-heirs with Christ of everything. The promise of God is that you and I get everything that God wants to give Jesus. You and I get to experience the full realization of the promise of God which comes in kingdom come. You and I get to know the resurrection life that Jesus brought into our world. And you and I also get to know the redemption that God can do where he even takes our most heinous and disgusting sins and produces something good through them. This is the scandal. The more you sin, the more God's grace comes to you. The more you sin, the more God's forgiveness is for you. In fact, God, in some ways, Paul is saying, go ahead and try him if you want. Go ahead and test it if you want. You cannot outdo God's love, grace, and forgiveness. Even the sins you haven't committed yet, God has already provided grace and forgiveness for that. Your unrighteousness, no matter how hard you try or no matter how badly you fail because you're trying to do right, will never be more powerful than the righteousness and forgiveness and grace of God. And Paul has to say after, the very next thing he says after this is, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, (laughs) but he has to say that because basically he was saying the more you sin, the more grace will abound. 
But he said, don't go that way. Because you also need to understand that your righteousness can produce life just like your wickedness can produce death. So be about the righteousness. But when you fall and when you fail, and all of us sitting in this room or sitting at home, we are right now before God sinners. We are right now before God facing the wrath that he has against sin because we're sinners. Yet if we link ourselves to Christ, then he will come and instead of giving us the punishment, he'll apply it to the cross where Jesus took it. Instead of disqualifying us from the promise, he'll apply the blood of Jesus to us which includes us into the promise. This is the scandalous mystery of God's grace that is for you and I no matter what we have done. And the truth is no matter what we're gonna do. There's an interesting verse about how God, um, how Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter six, you can check it out, but he says, don't you know that you are temples of the living God? Like God's spirit is inside of you. And if you were to go join yourself to a prostitute, in some sick way you would be joining together God and the prostitute. Like you need to understand this is what you are doing. And as I was kind of unpacking that in my mind and as we were singing that song about Egypt today, I just, I just felt like the Lord said, David, the ones you're praying for, the ones you know that are filled with my spirit and yet they're kind of going off. He said, I want you to know that I'm going with them. And it broke my heart. Not, not because of what these people are doing in their foolishness or deception, but because of how much God loves them. That he's willing to even go into the sickness, into the depravity, into the detestable things in order to be one step away from them. So that the minute they turn around like that prodigal, he's right there with open arms. Basically he was saying, hey David, my holiness can handle whatever sin someone might throw at me. Now again, there's, there's a lot more to unpack there. <laughs> we don't have time. But I just want you to know that God is with you. And he will go to the ends of the earth. He will go into whatever you take him into in order to be one step away from your salvation and your redemption and, and to get you back into the promise that he so longs to give you and the generations after you. Let's pray. It's always important for us to remember that when we say let's pray, at least at Living Streams, we don't necessarily mean let's say some more words. Prayer really is a lot more about listening than talking. So I, I wanna create this time of response right now where we can listen to the Spirit of God and see what he's saying to the church today. because his spirit alone knows how to make correct application in each of our lives. His spirit alone knows how to bring conviction instead of condemnation to our hearts. So please, don't, don't hear anything I have to say. Just listen to what the spirit is saying. 